Hello, listeners. This is Mike, your host. If you are enjoying these archive episodes, please consider supporting the podcast by going to the homepage, spacerockethistory.com, and clicking on the orange Donate button or the Patreon link. Hopefully, with your support, I can continue to release these archive episodes. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Godspeed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. I feel uh, Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? When that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Listen, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 179 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 9, the launch. This is a CBS News special report, the flight of Apollo 9. This morning, the launch of astronauts McDivitt, Schweikert, and Scott. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters, Kennedy Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. And it's T-minus 58 minutes and counting here at the Kennedy Space Center with the Apollo 5 rocket and the Apollo 9 spacecraft atop it waiting to go at 11 a.m. Eastern time with the countdown going perfectly so far. The astronauts are buttoned into the command module there atop that 363-foot-high rocket complex ready to go on what perhaps is the most dangerous mission yet in the Apollo program and a vital one if we are to get a man on the moon this year, as the late President Kennedy promised. The flight is to test, as we heard a moment ago, the LEM, the lunar module, which will be the craft to ferry man from the command module to the surface of the moon and back. It does not operate in an Earth environment. It operates only in space, the first true space vehicle we've ever had, therefore. And the men who ride it on this mission in Earth orbit, 150 miles or so above the Earth, must get it back to the command module after they once detached from that command ship in order to return to Earth. The major events on this mission today, the launch, of course, which is always a hair-raising part of any space mission, and then the uh, uh, docking of the command ship uh, with the lunar module, the extraction of it from uh, its garage that is carried into space with it, the top of that spacecraft, uh, top of the rocket, and that is the principal mission for today. And then on Wednesday, the first test of the lunar module's descent engine. On Thursday, a spacewalk by 33-year-old Rusty Schweikert, youngest member of this crew, the LEM pilot. He will take a two-hour and 15-minute walk from the LEM back to the spacecraft, to the command ship, and then back to the LEM again. And on Friday, the LEM flies for the first time on its own. The crew, Colonel James McDivitt, U.S. Air Force, 39 years old, a veteran of the Korean War and many combat flights there, the veteran of the Gemini 4 flight, when the late Ed White made his space walk. The command module pilot is Colonel David Scott, 36 years old, a veteran of the Gemini 8 flight, which was the only flight that had to come back and make an emergency landing in all of our 18 flights in the space program. And the lunar module pilot, a civilian, but uh, a National Guard flyer who had some active service in the Air Force, Russell Schweikert, 33 years old. It's T-minus 53 minutes and counting. There haven't been any delays in this count. There was a a brief uh, flurry of activity out on the launch battle earlier this morning when a helium valve that pressurizes uh, the third stage of the spacecraft and the booster, that is, uh, seemed to be malfunctioning, but uh, that was corrected in short order. It did delay the astronauts' uh, departure from their uh, crew quarters, however, and their 
ingress uh, into the uh, spacecraft by about eight or ten minutes, but apparently they've caught up the time, and the, sp and the countdown is going as planned and is on time for an 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, on time departure. The duration of this flight is to be nine days, 22 hours, and 47 minutes, uh, with splashdown at about 10.15, 10.17, something like that, a week from Thursday uh, in the Atlantic, 185 miles southwest of Bermuda, where the helicopter carrier, the Guadalcanal, will be standing by for the recovery. A week from Thursday, and CBS News correspondent Murray Frompson is on board the ship to report that event. Yesterday, he sent us this report on her crew's preparations. The Guadalcanal is a primary recovery ship, and for the past several days, we've been maneuvering southwest of Bermuda. Helicopter crews, frogmen, and medical teams have been running through a series of drills, using this model to simulate the actual recovery of Apollo 9. Those drills have been quite a challenge, conducted in choppy seas with high swells and waves, brisk winds, and some rain. One frogman lost his scuba tank, a shark had to be chased away by an alert helicopter pilot, and before this model could be retrieved, it was banged against the side of the Guadalcanal by the high waves, and the frogman had to leap clear. When the flight of Apollo 9 ends, the work of the Guadalcanal will just begin. Minutes before splashdown, the helicopters will take off and try to locate the honing signal being transmitted from the spacecraft. When they do, hopefully near this ship, the frogmen will start a series of procedures they've practiced so long to perfect. They'll put an anchor on the spacecraft, then place a flotation collar around it to prevent it from capsizing, and only then look into the welfare of the astronauts. If the team leader of the divers signals a thumbs up, that means the astronauts are safe and well. If, however, he signals a cross wrists, that means a doctor is needed immediately from the helicopter hovering just above. But everyone here optimistically predicts a flawless recovery and the safe return of the spacecraft to this deck. Because the launch of Apollo 9 was delayed, the Guadalcanal has been forced to sail back and forth in or near the recovery area. It's a good thing the space agency isn't paying by the mile. For as it turns out, in the curious logic and bookkeeping of Washington, in effect, NASA is paying rent for this ship to the U.S. Navy. Murray Thompson, CBS News, aboard the USS Guadalcanal. For the 19th flight of American astronauts into space, Vice President Spiro T. Agnew, representing the new administration of Richard Nixon, sat in the firing control room viewing area on March 3, 1969. He and other guests listened to the countdown of the Saturn Apollo structure several kilometers away at the edge of the Florida beach. Fully recovered from their stuffy heads and runny noses, McDivitt, Scott, and Swikert lay in the mixed atmosphere cabin of Command Service Module 104, breathing pure oxygen through the suit system. In Houston, more than 200 newsmen registered to cover the mission. One of those newsmen was Jules Bergman. He gave this report in the final minutes before launch. The atmosphere here was described in one word by Eugene Kranz, who's the flight director for Apollo 9. He called it electric. And perhaps the reason for that electricity is this thing that's standing behind me. That's the lunar module. It must behave properly on its own with two astronauts in it. It must behave properly with relation to the command service module, the sort of mothership for the flight. It is the trickiest mission that uh, Apollo astronauts have tried to fly so far, indeed the trickiest mission of manned space flight. It is more difficult, officials say, than the historic moon flight of Apollo 8. And many officials here say that they would be surprised if Apollo 9 does all that it is setting out to do. The Mission Control Center, which is the nerve center for this flight, was powered up yesterday at about midday. There are more people there now than there have been for previous missions because there must be people and control consoles for the limb and for the portable life support system, the uh, packs that the astronauts will use while the spacecraft to be pressurized. All told, there are about 30% more people in the entire Mission Control Center than there have been on previous flights. It's configured just about the same way as it will be when we make the flight to the moon. The major concern, of course, is the first five days in which the limb will be worked out. That's the busy part. And then there are five rather uneventful days. And some say, well, why have those uneventful days? Well, Chris Kraft, who's the director of flight operations, said that 
Anytime you put three men on top of a Saturn, you get all out of the flight that you can. Water? Remaining in Houston, flight director Gene Krantz watched the displays on his consoles while McDivitt and Capcom, Stuart Rosa, called off the events of the launch sequence. I thought it would be interesting to experience the launch of Apollo 9 from the viewpoint of flight director Gene Krantz in Houston. I'm sure you recall that Houston takes control of the mission after the rocket clears the launch tower. Now, these are the words of Gene Krantz. Quote, Surveying my launch team as the countdown progressed and looking at the enormous beast we were about to launch, I felt a disconcerting mixture of confidence and humility. I'm sure that the pad team did also. The Saturn V on the television screen in front of me was the world's most powerful machine, towering 363 feet above the flat Florida shoreline. My team, whose average age was 26, just a few years out of school, had within its hands the power to change the direction of history. On the launch pad, ice from the liquid oxygen tanks condensation glistened in the searchlights, mist swirled around the umbilical tower and platforms. At the top was the command and service module, with the detachable escape tower for the command module at the very tip of it all. Buried in the taper adapter section below the command service module and atop the launch vehicle was the lunar module, the spacecraft we would shortly test. Weighing over 6.5 million pounds, the Saturn rocket consumed 23 tons of kerosene and oxygen before it started to move. As it climbed along the launch tower, a ton of frost was shaken loose from the tanks, falling past the swing arms into the flame bucket. When the rocket exhaust hit the streams of water pouring into the flame bucket to absorb the intense heat, Steam billowed along the flame trench that directs the exhaust heat away from the launch complex. By the time the Saturn booster shed its first stage, two minutes and 41 seconds into flight, it had consumed almost five and a half million pounds of fuel. When you turn loose the energy of a Saturn rocket, you simply had to have trust in your crew, your team, and in yourself. Through trust, you reach a place where you can exploit opportunities, respond to failures, and make every second count. As gigantic as the machine was, and as puny as we humans were measured against the towering bulk, the human factors balance the technology on the scale. It would be this balance that would be, indeed had to be, maintained successfully throughout the manned spaceflight operations. The control room contained 21 team members, but the decision process during a Saturn launch focused on 10. The three booster engineers, Fido, Retro, Guido, two CSM system engineers, the Capcom, and myself, the flight director. We had a bewildering set of options facing us during the 12 minutes of powered flight. My mission rules were perched on the right corner of the console, a multicolored two-inch thick document containing several thousand rules for conduct of the mission. These rules had been whittled down to less than a hundred for launch. We knew from the pre-mission studies and simulations that a launch abort was the final and often risky option to terminate a mission. The nightmarish scenario we faced was making a wrong decision and placing the crew into orbit with no way to return to Earth. An equally nightmarish outcome was executing an abort that either was not necessary or that if executed improperly might also kill the crew. With only seconds to assess a situation and then pick a path, we had to determine clearly the course of action before we launched. 
it set for trajectory problems that allowed no alternatives, our judgment was that things had to be going to hell in a handbasket in the spacecraft or booster before we would abort the launch. The count progressed. In the final 15 minutes, you could feel this incredible pressure build. All controllers felt it. Once the Saturn was launched, we would be tied to our consoles for at least half an hour. I gave the controllers their final chance for a pit stop before the doors were locked. We made a final rush to the restrooms, standing in line, then sprinting back to the consoles. When I returned, I put on my white vest, while inwardly I was marching to the cadences of Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever. During most of the powered flight, our decision time frame was about 20 seconds, sometimes less. With our training, 20 seconds was a lifetime. In that time, you could detect a problem, hold several crisp conversations, select displays, make a decision, and issue the command slash voice instruction, all in less time than it takes to air a short television commercial. Nearing launch, an internal clock kicked in as auto sequence started. I could feel the sweat on the palms of my hands. This was, after all, my first manned Apollo launch as flight director. At launch, minus 50 seconds, the electrical power transfer from the launch pad to the command and service module fuel cells and batteries was complete. This brief period was a time that I hated. I always hated it. I had a long list of ground equipment I needed for launch scattered around the world, much of it mandated by the mission rules. I prayed it all held together for the next 20 seconds. I established my personal cutoff for killing auto sequence at launch minus 30 seconds. My risk judgment told me that the mission control center must suffer a crippling failure before I would call the launch team with a no-go. At this point, terminating the automatic launch sequence, I bowed my head briefly and made the sign of the cross as the engines roared and the crew called, Lift off, the clocks have started. End quote. Now, let's go back to Florida for the official countdown. Here's the voice of Cape Canaveral, Jack King. Follow Saturn launch control, T-minus five minutes and counting, T-minus five. Uh, the order has been given for the Apollo access arm to come to its fully retracted position, and now swing arm number nine uh, coming back to its fully retracted position. Uh, just before this order was given, we went through a final status check. The spacecraft is go. We also got a go from launch from mission director George Hage in Houston, and finally launch director Rocco Patron here in firing room two. Our status board shows launch support preparations are complete, and the ready lights are on for the instrument unit, the spacecraft, and the emergency detection system. We are go at T-minus four minutes, 21 seconds and counting. This is launch control. Saturn launch control coming up on three minutes, 50 seconds. Mark, T-minus three minutes, 50 seconds and counting. We are go for launch. The countdown now turned over to the control of the launch vehicle test conductor for the last four minutes of the count. We will go on an automatic sequence starting at three minutes and seven seconds. Final communications checks now in progress uh, between the spacecraft test conductor and the crew aboard the spacecraft. Some final checks in progress at this time. We have the report that we are clear for firing command. That is the automatic sequencer that should come in in about 15 seconds. From that time on down, all aspects of the mission will be automatic, monitored uh, by uh, the computers here in the control center and at the pad. 310, we have firing command. Launch sequence start. The computer is in. The sequence is in at this time. Mark, T minus three minutes. T minus three minutes and counting. Our preparation is now complete. Our ready lights are on here in the control center. During this period, the various uh, propellant tanks aboard the three stages of the Saturn V will be pressurizing. Primarily, we use helium on the ground to pressurize these tanks. The various vent valves will close uh, as the countdown proceeds. We've now passed uh, two, two minutes, 35 seconds, and counting. All still going well. 
Two minutes, 30 seconds. We should be getting an indication on pressurization of the third stage. We have it uh, here in the control center. Two minutes, 20 seconds and counting. The third stage now is pressurized. We'll be looking toward those uh, five engines in the first stage of the Saturn V. Uh, the ignition sequence to start at the 8.9 second mark in the countdown. We're now coming up on the two minute mark. Mark, T-minus two minutes and counting. T-minus two, all aspects of the mission still go at this time. The Apollo 9 crew standing by in the spacecraft. One minute, 50 seconds and counting. Once the ignition sequence does begin with the five engines, it'll take some uh, nine seconds or so to build up the proper thrust. Uh, the computers will automatically sample those engines and assure ourselves that we have 95% of the thrust. We will get a commit at that time and the four hold on arms will come back. We're now 90 seconds and counting, 90 seconds and counting. Vice President Agnew now has come up to the window here in the launch control center along with members of the party to view the launch. One minute, 20 seconds and counting. All indications are we are still go at this time. Third stage uh, propellant tanks have been pressurized. Final check uh, of several panels by lunar module pilot Rusty Swikert. Second stage tanks now pressurized. Swikert uh, confirms that he has the proper readings. One minute and counting. T minus 55 seconds and counting. All still going well. We're coming up on the power transfer. Mark, 50 seconds and counting. We're now on internal power uh, with the three stages and instrument unit of the Saturn V. Uh, all uh, propellant tanks in the second stage now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. The vehicle now completely pressurized. The vents closed. We are go. 30 seconds and counting. T minus 25 seconds and counting. All aspects still go at this time as the computer monitors. 20 seconds. Guidance release 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines running. Commit. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.
Apollo 9, uh, you have mode 4 capability and everything is go. You're real solid. Hey, Roger, what time do you think we can shut down? All uh, right. We'll have that for you in a flash, uh, Apollo 9. Ready? My onboard Fido here says we're doing okay. Yes, everything's looking good here, uh, Apollo 9. Okay. We'll try to have you cut off time shortly. Cut down. Uh, uh, Roger, shut down. Okay. Uh, Houston, we've got 103 by 89.5. Uh, Roger, Apollo 9, uh, copy. And Apollo 9, you are go in the orbit. Roger. And your CMC is go. It is valid. Okay. And Apollo 9, the S-4B has been safe. Uh, Roger, safe. Do you have a rapid jam Uh, not yet, uh, Apollo 9, stand by. Okay. Apollo 9, the S-4B has been configured for orbit. It's looking real good, and your SPS helium is solid as a rock. Uh, Roger, we copy. Thanks a lot. Uh, Roger. Less than one second after its scheduled 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time liftoff, Apollo 9 rumbled upward. There were the usual vibrations, but on the whole, the Saturn V's S-1C stage gave the crew what McDivitt called, quote, an old lady's ride, end quote. The big surprise came when its five engines stopped thrusting, Feeling as if they were being shoved back to Earth, the astronauts lurched forward, almost into the instrument panel. The S-2 second stage engines then cut in and pressed them back into their couches. Everything went well until the seven-minute mark, when the old pogo problem popped up again. Although the oscillations were greater than those of Borman's flight, McDivitt's crew lodged no complaints. At 11 minutes 13 seconds after launch, the S-4B third stage kicked itself and the two spacecrafts into orbit 190 kilometers above the Earth. Upon reaching their orbital station, the trio remembered Borman's warning against jumping out of the couches too quickly and flittering about in the weightless cabin. The men avoided sudden head turns, made slow, deliberate movements, and took medication, and still felt dizzy. But they were able to go about their duties, checking instruments and extending the docking probe. Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.